Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dan Gallant. Uh, I'm an engineer based out of New York City. Um, I joined Datadog a couple of months ago, uh, as Jess mentioned, um, but I should mention that uh, I joined after submitting this talk. None of the work I talk about and, and none of the things I sort of learned are related to what I work on at Datadog. In fact, uh, I learned some things about the work that the team working on Temporal at Datadog is doing from Eric's talk, um, and I'm really excited about it, uh, just like you probably are. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today at Replay 2023. I'm, I'm excited to be here with you all. Um, if you enjoy this talk, uh, or we run out of time, and you want to tell me that the opinions I share here are incorrect, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty easy to find. Or I have a blog at thelog.farm. Um, anyway, let's get into it. Workflows versus services, when, how, and why. Um, let's start with a quick basic question. Uh, why are we here? I think we're here because we like workflow engines uh, or workflow, the workflow programming model, or at least I do. Uh, you might also like uh, you know, the workflow programming model, or maybe you're just curious about them. Maybe you're a fan, but you're trying to figure out how to drive adoption. Uh, maybe you're trying to learn about best practices. Um, I've met quite a few folks here today who are still in the exploration phase or simply heard a term and, and heard it solve certain problems and found it interesting. Um, I think workflow programming, personally, for me, represents a powerful new way to address workloads that weren't easily handled by the, um, in tech I'm reticent to use the word traditional because everything's still fairly new, but sort of the, the REST, RPC, or even job-based models that we've seen or event-driven architectures. Um, and I think that workflow, uh, the workflow model brings us closer to properly modeling the workloads that, that we're tasked with today. Um, personally, I do see it as a paradigm shift and, and a, a positive one unequivocally. Um, and, and I imagine that some of you in the room here today do too. But we're smart, reasonable people, right? Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I assume we are. Um, and I think we can agree that, you know, when something new comes around and everyone says, like, hey, this solves all of your problems, like, the, the sort of the alarm goes off in your head, right? New, new technologies don't necessarily eliminate old ones. Um, and, and sometimes existing technology is, is perfectly well fit for the problems it addresses, right? Um, it, it's particularly frustrating when you feel like people have, like, an incentive to, to tell you that their thing is the best, right? Um, so there, there, there's value to exploring where existing approaches, you know, are, are still valuable. Um, and, and progress is often a, a sort of pendulum. Um, and we find that, you know, the old solutions that we, we threw out yesterday are, are, you know, the tomorrow's solutions, you know, with, a new, you know, with, with some things changed, right? Um, so that's what I want to explore today. Uh, when should we use workflows uh, to make sure that we're not hammering in screws? Um, how should we use them? What are some best practices? Um, and, and why do I think and how do, how do we know that you know, the workflow model um, or durable execution, uh, as, as, as we were corrected earlier, uh, is, is sort of a, a stable model to base our organizations, our technology, and you know, for some people, our entire business is on for the next you know, five to 10 years. Like, What are the tailwinds there, right? Um, before I get into that, maybe I should mention the perspective I'm coming from, right? Um, so I spent the last few years working on pretty complex uh, mortgage origination, underwriting, um, you know, tax collection, things like that, flows um, at, a, at a mortgage originator. Um, the workflow engine was built in-house and, and had a lot of similarities to Temporal, but some key differences. Um, and over time, I became an internal maintainer of this framework that I think 300, 350 engineers were using, um, and then you know became sort of a champion for it and advising folks on best practices and things like that. Right? Uh, when I learned about Temporal, uh, you know, maybe a year or so ago, I was incredibly excited to see a community forming around a uh, public technology that reminded me so much of a model that I think really force multiplied our, our productivity. Um, and to see it so well polished in particular uh, has, been, has been sort of encouraging. Um, and, and that's where I'm coming from today, right? I've spent a few years working in a system uh, 
similar, I would say, with fewer uh, you know, uh, supports uh, and, 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 and you know, fewer guarantees. Um, and, I, and I became a huge fan over time, and I, and I learned a lot about you know, how do we encourage people to use them? Uh, what use cases are, are more amenable, right? Um, and then, you know, things you want to guarantee uh, uh, as, you, as you build out your workflows, uh, how to deliver faster, and again, why it's, you know, particularly well suited to, I think, the next few years of, of software development. So let's restate why we're here. Um, we know we like workflow models like Temporal, um, but we know they're not magic. Uh, we want to know that we're using them well. Um, uh, and, and we want to know that we're, we're actually delivering on the guarantees that we're sort of selling. And then finally, like, we want to be sure that when we tell people, hey, there's this amazing new paradigm, that you know, the industry is sort of moving with us, right? Um, so I'll walk through all three of those, and, and I'll make my case for why I think the industry is moving with us over the next five to 10 years. So now that we have you know, concretely stated the problem, when do we workflow? Um, you should use workflows when you want to stably coordinate across microservices, uh, synchronize state, you want fault tolerance. Um, these are all things that you'll see uh, if you go into the documentation and, and you're just kind of poking around. Um, these are not things I'll be talking about today. Um, I think these are excellent guarantees and I commend the team for, for uh, building such a quality product around them. But I think to actually speak to some of the things Max talked about during his keynote, these are all pretty specific to a microservices oriented execution model. Um, and they're also specific to Temporal, which you know, I've used, I've enjoyed, but I think they're, you know, we, can, we can generalize where workflows are, are useful. Um, and, and that means that we can zoom out from sort of hardware related and network related uh, guarantees that we talk about. Um, and, and that's what I'd like to do today. Uh, let's push all of our concerns about distributed systems, durability, distribution, aside for now, uh, and zoom out from strictly these sort of hardware-related concerns. Um, I think Sergey from the Temporal team puts it best in his blog post on the site. Uh, in my mind, it's about inversion of execution. It's about where the coordination layer is. And that's not related necessarily to where the software actually runs, whether it's in a microservice or a monolith, right? Um, so let's talk about where you should work, use workflows in terms of you know, the advice I've given over time. I want to be very clear that these are just indicators. Um, they're not hard rules for me, uh, and I'm not saying they should be hard rules for anyone else. I don't even necessarily believe that like, if you meet two of these, uh, you know, then you know, right? Um, these, are, these are vibes, these are, these are smells, right? Um, and the list is not exhaustive. I had about 12 to 15 key indicators when I started writing this, and they've been roughly condensed and categorized, but this is meant to be a starting point from where you can do your own thinking when you're advocating for workflows inside your own organization. Um, so with that said, when do we workflow? The first indicator that I think a workflow model will work for you versus a service is one we've heard a lot about today, when time moves slow. Uh, any setting where any significant action, one that delivers value to your business, is what I call highly asynchronous, right? Outside the lifespan of a request or, or a timeout. Um, that's one where I think you wanna start thinking about a workflow. And we've heard a lot about this today. It's actually been encouraging to hear other speakers uh, talking about this. The, the key thing I wanna point out is that highly asynchronous can also mean non-finite, right? Um, we saw in the presentation on the new Datadog integration that you know, a lot of our observability tools out there assume a finite root span, and that's fundamentally incompatible with some of the businesses that folks are running today. Right? The trend is changing, but over the last, I think, 15 or 20 years, we've unconsciously coupled to sort of the REST model, where we have these quick, isolated interactions which is markedly different than maybe the, la the, the, you know, the 20 years prior where we were doing bulk operations. And I think that's informed tools that are not even necessarily related to those request life cycles, right? If your application is primarily driven by user interactions where a user might need to go check their email, 
or physically find a bank statement. And then an another user might need to you know, verify that information. That's what I'm talking about. That's the, that's the indication of, of highly asynchronous workloads. Um, you'll see that in those settings, average interaction lifespans move from you know, milliseconds, seconds, minutes into like minutes, hours, days, right? Um, there's a great blog post out there by an engineer named Hazel Weekly who talks again about the observability case where uh, browser, uh, browser sessions stay open for days and weeks. Like, I, I, you know, I, I'm guessing everyone in the room is pretty similar to me where you close your browser when the corporate IT reminder tells you to restart your computer, right? Um, and again, we've leaked this short lifespan model into you know, the OTEL collectors that assume this finite root span, right? Um, when your interactions are you know, days, you know, weeks, months, whatever, you, you need to think about a different paradigm. I would say you know, the, the, quick, uh, the quick reaction to this is like, well, what about the abandoned cart life cycle, right? We, we all have an abandoned cart life cycle in our business. That's, I think you can, you can get away with using crons to do something like that, but when it's most of your interactions, I think you really do need to start thinking about an alternate model. Um, this also creates a situation where coordination cannot easily be handled by a client. Again, these short interactions have meant that like, we're operating on a basis of resources that are then coordinated by another service or by a front end. But when your processes are uh, highly asynchronous, when you need this durable execution, uh, putting that into a front end means creating 17 different job types that all pull independently and have custom weight behavior. Um, and that creates a lot of load on your engineering team. So to sum it up, if you see these long life cycles, these unstable life cycles, ones where one user stays in an interaction for five minutes and another stays in it for three days, I think that's an indicator that you might want to try, you know, putting a workflow on it, right? Um, the next one is one I haven't heard as much about, um, and it's one I want to kind of clarify a little bit. Um, I call this uncharted territory. Uh, in a lot of interactions, we know exactly what we need next, right? So I'll, I'll show you an example in a second, but you can think of a lot of interactions where you're pretty certain about the data you'll need to provide. You pull up a website on your phone and you're like, I want to buy this shirt. You know you're going to be asked for credit card information, right? A lot of the businesses that are popping up and digitizing today are not that, right? Um, and it means that coordinating via a client becomes incredibly complex very quickly when the reactions needed to run that process become highly contingent and highly branching, right? Uh, workflows offer a unique uh, sort of advantage over job-based solutions that I'll talk about a little bit later, but why don't we look at an example? So this is an unfortunate example given that we learned uh, about how complex food ordering was uh, today. Um, and I find that providing a simple example to engineers is often difficult because someone in the room will be like, actually, buying a shirt is very complicated. Um, so I ask you to bear with me and let's take a look at a very simple food ordering model. You have a handful of parties. You have the, the user who's ordering food, the restaurant, the driver, the vendor that are essential to the interaction, let's say. And you have some information that you need to collect over time, uh, like credit card information, an address, a schedule, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you have roughly two terminal states, right? The, um, the, the food gets delivered or it doesn't for whatever reason. You also have some light looping, right? If I enter my credit card information incorrectly, the page will reject what I've entered and I'll, I'll be asked for it again, right? There's driver data, there's complicated things around that, um, and, and clearly this is a simplified example, but one order on a food delivery app roughly looks like the next, right? We roughly know what data we're, we're asking users for and what we're trying to tank up into our state each time we get an interaction, right? Uh, it's pretty reasonable to write an application where you coordinate interactions through a client or a front end here, right? Because each workload roughly looks like the next. The branch and circular return conditions are there, but they're limited. Now let's take a look at loan origination. 
Uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pretend anyone can read what this says on the side here. I apologize. But the key things I want you to take away are first of all, there are unbounded parties, right? You have a borrower. You might have co-borrowers. You might have co-signers. Um, the as opposed to the food delivery interaction where you have one driver to one delivery, you might have an unbounded infinite set of people who work at the originator processing the actual loan, right? Um, the loan details, you know, I, I might have a US address, I might not. Is that US address somewhere abroad on like a diplomatic territory, right? That's a question. Um, you need to collect a lot more information, but the key thing is these, is these little boxes at the bottom, which is that you actually have to restart this whole process the second you add another party. You have to ask all these questions, most of them, if you have a co-borrower or a co-signer, right? Also, none of these interactions are necessarily sequenced. If I collect your income and then need to verify it in order to move you along in the process, I could concurrently be asking you for your assets and be verifying those, right? There are these sort of, there are these states where we, we become highly asynchronous and then we need everything to join back up in order to move the, to the next point in the flow. My point isn't that a mortgage is more complex than ordering takeout. It's that it's more individualized, right? It's higher in cardinality. Um, it's kind of more variadic in some sense if you think of you know, programming interfaces and it's therefore more branching. Um, also, each of these interactions might take a human in the loop, as we've heard throughout the day, right? And, and that means that sometimes some of these verifications might not come for days, right? And, and we can't just sit there and pull jobs until the end of time, right? A, a colleague of mine uh, who, who helped me with this likes to say that essentially the workflow model abstracts the programming model up to the human scale, right? Previously, we were limited by functions that limited actions that could be executed uh, in the runtime, uh, and then eventually, you know, we move to like awaits, futures, things like that. But what you know, durable execution, which we had a version of, gives you is the ability to arbitrarily wait for human scale interactions. Uh, workflows give us the ability to model processes of arbitrary or infinite duration and decoupled from any single process or machine, even if you don't need that decoupling ability. Um, some workflow engines might model this as ordinary functions, others use different representations, it doesn't matter. But the key thing is that you're now closer to programming and modeling the actual uh, operation that you're trying to uh, deliver rather than a single request that then composes into this interaction. Um, we're deleting incidental complexity uh, that comes from executional plumbing rather than what we're actually trying to achieve. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is state and states. Um, like I said, you collect a lot of information. A lot of that information is highly contingent on the previous information you were given, right? I don't need Texas taxes from you if you're not trying to buy a property in Texas, right? Mind blowing, I know. Um, but you know, you'll, you'll, you'll see a lot of this sort of logic in traditionally built applications, right? The old goal was this sort of statelessness where any time uh, you know, a, an input was, was, uh, w was added and it was incorrect, we would just kick you back to the beginning of the form and ask you for you know, your credit card information again. Well, what if the information that I gave you um, that was incorrect was only incorrect in the context of information I gave you, you know, three forms ago? And I now either need to go correct the information I just gave you or go back three forms, right? That's where, by the way, you might want to have a human looking at all of this because that's contextual information that you might not even be able to figure out. Like you might not be able to code around that. And the ability of workflows to actually allow you to put a human in the loop is the key ability there, right? As you decompose all of this state building, right? We're, we're real heavy on state. What you're actually doing is introducing a ton of states into your application. Um, and eventually you'll likely back yourself into this model anyway. I've seen a few companies I've talked to do this, um, but you won't have as good of a primitive and so you'll kind of be stuck, right? The more forms you have, the more data points collected, collated into these states, the more you're gonna have to wait around them and the more you're going to want a fundamental primitive to work with. Um, again, a smell, if you, if you have a lot of forms, take a look at the workflow model, right? 
what you'll get with it is replayability and an audit trail that you wouldn't have otherwise if you grew this at home or if you used a different model. And as you uh, lean into this state building and all of these states, you're going to need it to figure out whether it's the most recent information I gave you that's wrong or the one three forms ago, right? Um, again, the same colleague who's helped me out with this talk, much smarter guy than me, really should be up here instead, uh, said that you know his, his, his evaluation model is, if you have a system that has a handful of very data intensive interactions, you might want to think about API design. If you have to call three APIs with dozens and dozens of data points each, you might want to think a lot about API design. If instead what you have is a system that has hundreds or thousands of API calls, or hundreds or thousands of interactions that need to be fueled by three or four data points, this is where workflows can really save the day. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about when. Um, you know, just like code can have a smell, architecture can have a smell, and I think that when I see sort of problems arising from these base requirements, that's where I sort of see we should have a workflow. So let's talk a little bit about how. Uh, the first thing that I kind of I realized over time working in a workflow model is that you want to think step by step versus layer by layer. Uh, when writing a, again, quote unquote, traditional service oriented ap application, the common model I see uh, you know, to do like an MVP is you shave off the core 40% of your users and you build an end to end flow for them, right? So you say, okay, I'm gonna do food delivery for only people who live in Brooklyn and we'll do that perfectly and we'll allow people from Brooklyn to order food. What that means is that anyone who's not in that 40% uh, needs to be handled manually or just rejected right off the bat, right? And that's not to say MVPs are a bad approach because what you do then is, I call it paving the high highway. You know, your 40% is your more most traveled lane and you pave the first lane. And then your next 20%, let's say, is your, your, your middle lane, right? And you pave that next and you do that end to end. And then your next lane after that and your next lane, and eventually you've covered all your users. Um, this is not a model that is super helpful when your uh, experiences are long lived and complex and highly contingent and have a lot of variable outcomes. So when working with engineers you know, at my previous company, what I found was you know, better for delivering value quickly was instead laying the tracks ahead of you, encapsulating every unit of information that you need to bring you closer to your final state, and then sort of laying the railroad in front you know, tie by tie, right? What that means is, because again, workflows allow you to inject a human into the loop, is that you're actually leveraging this key advantage to deliver value progressively, which is the sort of original sort of selling point of doing an MVP, right? You, uh, each step, you, you automate, and then you can kick people out to manual handling, where previously you just have to reject them. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's it. <laughs> I got lost in my notes there for a sec. Um, the next piece of advice I would always give uh, engineers is decoupling and coupling. We heard a little bit about, uh, about you know, the, the false promise of decoupling in event-driven architectures uh, from Max earlier. And I think a lot of engineers hear coupling and, they, and they, you know, the hair stands up on the back of their neck, but I think there's actually some advantage. Um, that being said, the, the power of our workflow engine originally was that it allowed us to decouple all of these individual steps and reorder them where we needed to by driving application state through the data model. So we would take data, we would collect it, we would write it to the database, and following workflows would uh, be assigned and, and start working based off that mutation of data. And what that meant was that since we didn't have necessarily a strict ordering of the work that needed to be done, um, we could reorder in order to optimize conversion, we could reorder in order to wait until users had the information they needed from later in the process. Um, and that was incredibly powerful for, again, incrementally delivering value in highly complex processes. Um, essentially, you're, you're mutating this data to drive application state, um, and, and it's sort of a new execution model. It gets a lot more complex when you've figured out your flow and you don't need to move things around, and what you actually need to do is tell your user like where they are, right? Um, and so what you want to do later on, once you've delivered the end-to-end -end flow, I've found, 
is actually coupling in order to do better sort of user-facing observability and uh, UX, right? Um, but the key advantage here is that, again, uh, rather than a traditional state machine, you can actually sort of flip things around and manipulate it in a pretty lightweight way. And the last piece of advice that I had for engineers working in our workflow model was to use the primitive. Um, what do I mean by use the primitive? Uh, again, quoting uh, Sergey uh, Baikov, Bikov, I'm, I'm not sure how it is. Uh, um, but, uh, um, you know, th the workflow model to me is just a, a, an evolution of the job model. But the key advantage is that it has a primitive wrapped around it. We saw a very clear example in Eric's presentation, uh, you know, just a half hour ago, of this sort of uh, schema protobuf, right? Um, and once you have that common sort of uh, primitive to work with, you can do a lot of amazing things. One of the things that we did um, that I'll endorse from Eric's presentation is we actually had a schema around our workflows that we used to generate UIs. And again, as I mentioned, I think workflows are incredibly popular when you have hundreds or thousands of forms you need to write, but you don't want to sort of like hire and ramp linearly people to do that, right? So instead, write your workflows, wrap them in a primitive, and then generate your UI similar to what I saw. And, and I will say, you know, the work that Eric presented, it, it's, I, I, I don't exactly know how old it is, um, but this was a model that helped us over years, right? And I think it was incredibly powerful along with the other things I mentioned. Um, the other thing you can do is that uh, um, you can write self-instrumenting code, right? Uh, Bruno talked about this a little bit, and I actually have a whole separate talk about it. But the problem with the REST RPC model is that they're not strictly specified enough, or they don't force you to do things uh, sort of the same way enough in order to truly deliver on, like, you don't have to emit metrics here, right? If you can use, if you can provide a primitive to your users that is strictly specified, you can then write all of your hooks. And I have a link at the end of the talk, but I have a talk about exactly how we did this. Um, as we sort of move into the next section and wrap up, I, I do have kind of a sad admission. Um, I did have about 10 more best practices listed out when I first started writing this. Um, but as I dug around more and more in the temporal uh, documentation, I actually found that Temporal implements just about all of them uh, and probably dozens or hundreds more uh, you know, best practices. Um, and so I think that makes me really sort of optimistic about the future of the model um, you know, with sort of temporal stewardship. Uh, so let's move into why. Why now? Um, I think over, you know, over the last 10 years, I've heard this phrase a lot that like software is eating the world, right? But I think if I look around me, I see that we ate sort of the easy businesses, right? Um, I'm not calling any business like universally easy, but I think there's a difference between, I'm not gonna try and choose a simple example in front of you, um, but you know, things like uh, you know, background checks, we heard you know, folks from Checker are here. Um, I think for a variety of reasons, entering simple spaces where the moat is just purely network effects uh, is not necessarily sustainable or viable in 2023. One, maybe two companies will enter sort of simple, uh, low-hanging fruit areas um, and then begin to compete with many others. Um, and between an absence of capital scarcity and that competition, I think it'll drive a lot of folks out of those spaces. But the slow, unattractive products, I mean, I'm up here in front of you talking about how I worked on mortgages, right? Um, those, I think, are you know, an apt uh, avenue for, for exploration in the next 10 years. Um, our municipal vendor software, ERP software, you know, car insurance, airlines, uh, even sort of the vertical SaaS that you've been hearing uh, about a lot, is at best, in many cases, 20 years old. Um, I can tell you I recently started a new job and I was not using you know, a modern piece of software, and it showed, right? Um, the next Instagram, in my mind, will probably look more like the next SAP, right? And I think the next 10 to 20 years of digitization will be focused on applying software to these long, variadic, boring, but important products. Uh, it's exactly these use cases uh, that I just listed out that I, I think are particularly well-suited to workflow engines and are worth the overhead um, that they incur. And I think workflows will go mainstream, if you will, as these companies start to challenge and replace the incumbents. Uh, 
uh, the businesses that we're modeling are becoming as complex and restart sensitive as our data pipelines. And I'm sure folks in the room have seen sort of demands of software converge from the sort of like OLAP world uh, and the OLTP world. And we need properties of both of these models in one place, right? Uh, but we can't just chain a bunch of jobs together. We can't go back to the 80s and 90s. Uh, we know that we need these replayability and audit sort of capabilities uh, in order to build scaling businesses. I think 2010's era technical culture and its advancements are, are growing up and moving into sort of the spaces that we last digitized in the early aughts, 90s, 80s, et cetera. And they'll need to adapt to a world that's more mistake sensitive, less responsive, less controlled, and honestly less fakeable and susceptible to things like optim uh, you know, op optimistic returns. Um, I think workflows are the next technical innovation that will help us build in, in that world. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, like I said, my name is Dan Gallant. Thank you for joining us. Uh, yeah. Woo!